All right, hello everybody. Welcome to our monthly learn hour. Uh, super excited to get going. We'll probably give everybody a, a few extra minutes if they're just working on some deadlines and running a little bit late. Uh, just like last time, thanks for already sending through some comments here, Dale. Um, if you guys wanna send through name, company, just what you guys are working on, that'll be awesome to kind of continue to grow this Clear Calcs community. You guys uh, either network or see the other types of users that are using clear calcs. So like I mentioned, we'll just wait a couple minutes here and we'll go through it. But as you see on the, we'll be talking load paths today and load path tracking. We got about 30 of our 251. Not the best percentage, but <laughs> 30 is still a solid turnout so far. And then to be honest, probably just gonna give it about one more minute because I know Laurent's got some good stuff for us today. So I wanna make sure we have time for your guys' questions. Last month when we did that Q&A, that worked awesome. We were able to get some good questions and then it's an off. Welcome, Mark, Sid King County Plans Examiner. Wonder if that's King County. What is that up in Seattle? I forget. Could be very wrong, but I could be right. <laughs> but welcome, Mark. All right. Uh, so what we're gonna do? We're gonna get going. Um, if we have a few, and like I mentioned, make sure to post uh, name, company, um, what you guys are working on. And all right, just outside Seattle, I was close. <laughs> uh, so put your name, company, what you guys are working on. That way we can continue to grow this Clear Calcs community. And then as we have stragglers, they can kind of join in. And of course we're recording this. So make sure to watch it back in the future and, and send it along to friends. So as you see on our screen, we're gonna be talking load paths and specifically your load path tracking clear calcs. Um, so if we wanna jump to the next slide here, we can start to talk about a little bit of background about clear calcs. Um, if you guys aren't familiar, then we'll go into really what we're talking about today. So everybody here that's either current trialist, former trialist or current user, a um, little background about clear calcs you guys already know but we're a cloud-based platform looking to be eliminate any wasted time you guys have on your designs and make sure we're available everywhere whether you're on laptop tablet phone office home on site you got access to all your projects and you can even collaborate remotely with everybody and then to meet the presenters today i'll start from the bottom we got laurent who's our North American engineering content lead. Uh, so everything you guys see in the US and Canadian calculators, you can thank Laurent for. Uh, <laughs> we also got Eva who we're super excited. She joined the team uh, recently, uh, structural engineering developer. She's got a ton of experience in commercial structural engineering. So very excited to have her joining. And then I'm sure I've talked to most of you guys already. If not, nice to meet you guys virtually. Uh, even though I can't see you, uh, but I'm our director of customer success. So anytime you guys have questions, you want to run through a demo training session outside of this, more than happy to connect. And then today specifically, I mentioned it a few times, but load path concepts, load path tracking, and specifically in clear calcs using our load linking feature. Um, and then we'll also go through some worked examples that Laurent has has kindly put together for this presentation. And at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Laurent because I'm boring and he's gonna talk about the exciting stuff. All right, well, hey everyone. Um, for the record, I, Connor, I don't think anybody thinks you're boring. Uh, so <laughs> just to make sure that's clear. But uh, hi everyone, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's really nice to be doing one of these webinars again. Um, so as Connor said, we'll be talking today about load paths. So uh, we had a few weeks ago, another webinar about tributary areas. And some of you might recognize this picture from there. And interestingly, um, I couldn't find a better picture to explain this concept as well. So 
let's go through it. So last time you might remember there were some arrows. Um, we're going to have the same thing here. So the idea here with the load path is like a river, the water has to go to the ocean, right? Um, there's very few places in the world where water doesn't end up in the ocean. So it's the same kind of thing with structures. There's very few structures in the world where the load doesn't end up in the ground. So you can see here, this is the path that the water takes, right? So it starts in a little creek and then it goes to this other bigger creek, then bigger creek all the way into the river, which presumably ends up in the ocean. So the difference here when we're talking about load path um, is we're looking at you know the actual flow of the loads or water in this case. We're not looking at how much water is behind it and, and filling up into it. We're really looking at, okay, how does it actually get, what's the direction it takes to go down to the ocean or the ground if we're talking about a structure? So again, this structure might seem familiar from the previous webinar. Again, couldn't find a better picture to explain this. So let's look at a typical load path for this uh, pergola here. So we'll start with the little pearl in here. So the load goes, from the kind of decking or whatever that is to a rafter. From the rafter, it keeps going all the way to this beam here. To this beam, it goes to this post. And then to this post, it goes down to the ground, um, presumably through a footing or something like that, right? Um, so the difference here in, in the previous webinar, we spoke about tributary area. So we were looking at, okay, well, how much of the area is this purlin taking? How much of the area is this rafter taking? We're not really going to talk about that here. We're really caring about how does the load actually kind of travel. Um, we don't care how much load, we just care what's the path that it takes. That, that's what it's a load path. And this comes in really useful. Um, obviously, this is kind of a simple structure, so it's not that bad. But if you think about bigger, more complex structures or stuff when you've got wind load and gravity loads applied at the same time, every single pound of weight has to go down to the ground. Otherwise, you, your building's not going to stand, right? So um, that, that's a really important concept. And that's why load paths are so important. So obviously, you know, if you're designing a house your whole life, um, you probably don't need to dry it out every time. You've got a pretty good idea of how the load goes by. But when you're dealing with a more complex structure or a new concept, it's a really good idea um, to, to, to make that drawing and then actually kind of write it out. Okay, how does my load go through the ground? So very you know brief talk it's not a very complex subject i think so we're going to hop now straight into the examples so what we're going to do here um we're basically going to walk through a variety of scenarios in clear calcs and basically the, the main concept is like i discussed with the load paths we're going to take a floor load and we're going to see how it goes all the way down to the ground um so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to walk through it in the slides um, briefly, the different concepts that we're going to look at, and then we'll skip over into clear calcs and work on this together. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to link a joist to a beam. So joists, we can link them as line loads. So we don't have to you know, add manually add a joist every 16 inches or something like that. That's all considered automatically. The only thing you need to do is link it as a line load. Next, we're gonna look at, okay, what if I've got a beam, my joist is sitting on the beam, now this beam is linking to another beam. This one, we're gonna link it as a point load. And then one thing that's important here is oftentimes when you'll have a beam framing into another beam, that can also prevent um, lateral torsional buckling or it's, it serves as a brace. And so you can get a bit more strength out of that. So in clear calcs will let you automatically add that brace. Uh, that's something we'll, we'll look at it later. Next, obviously that beam's gotta sit on the column. So we're gonna look at that. Um, again, same thing, we're linking it as a point load. Interesting thing here is we've got eccentricity. So for instance, if you've got connections that kind of put a little eccentricity on your column, you're gonna want to look at that. And then finally, we're also gonna look at, um, you know, that column has to go to a footing. Of course, we can also link that. So we can get the constant links all the way down. Now, let's hop into clear calcs and let's take a look at how this actually looks like in practice. So I'm going to come here. Okay, so we've got clear calcs going now. Um, so I've created two joist uh, calculators here. Um, these are, you know, wood beam ASD calculators. You can open it and you can see. Um, these are just the default values that we have. I'm not gonna complicate our lives. Important thing here is they're 14 feet long. Our dead load is 10 PSF, live load 40 PSF, typical residential thing and joist spacing is 16 inches. If I go for the bathroom joists, it's gonna be the same thing. So you can look, 
I just created these early just so we could uh, save ourselves a bit of time. But you can see 10 PSF, 40 PSF, also 14 feet long. So now I'm going to design a beam that's holding these up. So I'm going to create a new calculation. Wood beam ASD. And let's select a floor girder because we're supporting our joist. So if I come here, that's going to create a beam now. We're just going to let that show up. And OK. So the first thing I'm going to do once this loads is I'm going to go and link my uh, my joist. So if I go to my loads, I can delete this floor load because that's going to be accounted for with my linking. So I'm just going to delete this. And now I can go to my line loads and I can link and then select my bathroom. And then in this case, because it's a uniform load, it's gonna be the same reactions at either end of the joist. So it doesn't really matter which one we pick. Obviously, if you've got a more complex situation, you might wanna be mindful of which support you're, say, you're, you're selecting here. So we'll just select this one. And then we're gonna have these joists from zero to the end of my beam, so zero to L. And you can see it's got my reactions uh, updated. So 280 pounds per linear foot and then 86 pounds per linear foot for dead. And I'm going to add the same thing for my uh, bedroom joists. So let's go here again, 0 to L. And you can see it's the same reactions as well. So now I've got my bedroom joists on one side, my bathroom joists on the other side. They're linked into my beam. Now I can see, oh, I'm not passing anymore, right? It's failing in bending. So right now I've got three plies of two by 12. So maybe I'm going to decide, hey, I want to switch to LVL instead. So maybe I figure I'll only need two plies. So I'm going to switch to two plies. And then if I go in my size and grade, I've got my LVL select. And maybe I want micro lamps because that, that's what's available in my area. So we call them species. Um, obviously, a bit of an odd species micro lamp, but um, it's a grade or brand or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I'm going to select micro lamp. And I can see here going down, going down, going down. Oh, one and three quarters by 11 and a quarter. Seems to be passing. Perfect. Select it. So I've got my two plies of micro lambs and everything is good, right? So we're passing in bending, deflection. Life's good. Okay. So now we had talked about, okay, what if this beam here is sitting on top of another beam? And just to make things a bit more fun here, we're going to create a beam, but let's make a steel beam this time. So I'm going to go here, floor girder. And we're just going to let that load up here. And so we're going to change a couple things here. So the first thing is obviously the default values for steel, since typically they're longer spans, they're a little different. But in this case, we'll make it a 15 foot beam. And then we're going to go to our load. So 15 feet. We're going to delete this floor load. And this is where we're going to add it. So let's say, for instance, in this case, we've got another bedroom on one side of our beam. And then we've also got this, uh, this girder coming in, framing into this uh, steel beam. So let's start by adding our bedroom joists that are going to be sitting on um, this beam. So I'm going to link and say bedroom. Going to select this. Again, 0 to L. OK, so I can see my bedroom jo uh, joister here. And then point and moment loads, I can remove this one. And then I'm going to just link here beam three, right? That's my LVLs that are supporting the bathroom and the bedroom. So do this. You can see 4,400 pound vertical reaction. And let's just say it falls smack dab in the middle. So L over two, seven and a half feet. And here we go. So now we've got a W12 by 40. We probably don't need something that big. So I'm going to go up here and select something different. Now, I could filter by max depth. So say I wanted a eight inch the, the beam. If I type eight here, you'll notice not every W8 section actually shows up here. And the reason that's the case is because when you're typing in the max depth filter here, we're actually looking at the, the actual depth. So obviously W8 is a nominal section. So that some W8s are eight and a half inches deep or something like that. So the idea here is, is we want to be kind of strict with the architectural requirements, so we stick to that. But if I want to look at W8s for some reason, I can just come here and type the filter and type W8, and all of a sudden I've got all my W8 sections. So in this case, going down the list, I'm going to, oh, one second. <laughs> I'm going to come here and type 
uh, W8 by 18, right? That passes. So perfect. I've got my moment uh, figured out. 97%, we're right on. And okay, I've got my beam now. So now this beam, if we look, is supporting my bedroom joists on one side and then my LVL joist on the other side. If I click on here, you can see I'm going to end up in my LVL calculator again. So it's all linked. And then the idea here is if I make a change here, it'll propagate down. But let's wait for that. Now let's go and create a column that's going to support our uh, steel beam. So I'm going to create a new calculation. Let's do a steel column, ASD. Let's do an interior isolated column. So if I come here, this is going to be basically my post that's going to support uh, this steel beam at one end. So I come here. We're going to do the same thing again. We're going to go straight to the loads. We can delete these ones because we're going to be linking them. And we're going to create a link. And this is in the axial lateral moment loads table. And we're going to select B4. That's our steel beam. And if I look, I can see 5100, 5100. Um, let's pick this first one. So now I've got my steel beam linked into it. So one thing that we might want to do here is consider eccentricity. So maybe my connections, I don't expect that they'll be perfectly lined up. So a lot of designers will like to put in a eccentricity. And I know that, that what's pretty common is to add um, a sixth of the section width. So if I do D over six, I'll see, oops. 2.33 inches. Um, so just to add a little bit of moment at the top so that we know we're comfortable if the connection doesn't line up, that, that our column can still resist it. And then we can also go into weak axis loads here and do the same thing. So here in this case, it'll probably be B over six. Uh, whoops. Laurent, when they're yeah. in clear calcs, where can they find these, like that D over six or the, like you just mentioned, B over six? That's a great variables. question. So if you go into member properties here, you'll be able to see some. Now, if you want to see all of them, as in this case, you can go into the detailed mode and all of a sudden you'll be able to see, oops, all of the properties that, that you've got a, uh, available for selection. So. In this case, for some weird reason, I'm not seeing the, the section width. So in this case, we'll, we'll just kind of make our lives easier and we'll just type D over six here. You'll see it doesn't really matter for this case. We'll see about that in a second. Um, but so what we're doing here with these eccentricities is we're saying my beam above isn't perfectly lined up with the center of my column. So it's going to want to make it twist a little bit the column. And it's going to do this in both kind of uh, directions of my column. So in this, in the, the web direction and in the flange directions. Um, now, a W14 by 90 for a little residential basement is a little excessive. Um, that's going to be like a thousand pounds for one column, which is a little excessive. So we're going to change that. Um, one thing that we see a lot in, in basements in North America are lally columns, right? Where we have the little pipe section that, that supports it. So let's go with that. So the first thing we're going to do, because we know we're going to be looking at pipe sections, pipe sections are typically 35 KSI yield strength. Um, that's something that you can check that AISC has a great reference on typical yield strengths and what's available. Um, if you're in Canada, it's the same kind of thing. Of course, in Canada, we have the added complexity that some stuff comes from Canada, some stuff comes from the US, and we've got different uh, different yield strength depending what factory comes from. Some to be mindful of. But in this case, we're going to be looking at 35 KSI. I can type that in here. And now I'm going to go and select. So first thing I'll do is I'll switch to a pipe. And now if I'm using just the standard pipes here, um, let's see what we've got. So I think the standard pipes are scheduled 40 pipes. If I go down, I see two and a half uh, inch pipe works. So let's select that. And we'll let it do its thing. OK. So now we can see we're passing everything. So a lot of uh, inputs here. These are all related to deflection, so obviously we don't want our, our pipe or our column to start looking like a banana if, it, if there's a little bit of misalignment. So that's what we're checking with these uh, deflection checks. And then we're also looking at the, the, the actual bending and how that interacts with the axial load as well going down the column. So that's what we're looking at here. Everything passes. We're happy. Things are good. So now 
the next thing that we got to do is obviously our column is sitting on a footing. It's got to go down to the ground, right? That's that's the whole point of the load paths. Every single pound must be accounted for going down to the ground. So again, this thing is linked to our steel beam, which is linked to our joist, which is linked to our LVL, right? Everything is linked together. So now we're going to go and add a footing. So I'm going to come here and I'll create a spread footing. So we'll let that load up. And okay, so now we've got a seven foot by seven foot footing. That's pretty big for a small residential footing. But again, we'll skip past that for now and we're gonna scroll directly to our loads. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete this row. Again, we're linking so we don't need to add manual loads. And I'm just gonna link now um, my column. That's my post that Thing. So 5,180, obviously we want the bottom reaction at the top, there's, there's no loads. So we look at the bottom of our column, that's going into our footing. All right, and now we can see we've got our loads linked in. Now, coming back up, the other thing we'll wanna change are our column properties. Now this doesn't change too many things, but it's good to, you know, for good measure to, to keep it proper. We're just gonna show that we actually have a pipe coming in. So if I select steel column with steel base plate, I can come here and I can select my uh, pipe two and a half here. And let's just do a four by four uh, base plate. Now I can see my bearing pressure is really low. I can definitely lower the size of my footing. So let's go to two and a half by two and a half feet. Hey Laurent, when you just put in the dimensions of that column property, curious. Yeah talking about our load linking, our linking feature. Uh, and I'm sure you yes. can tell I'm being a bit cheeky. Is there something we're doing here in the future about maybe linking so that this uh, this footing knows the dimensions or what type of column is being linked? That's a, that's a really great question, Connor. Um, being a little cheeky, exactly. Uh, we've actually just implemented this feature kind of behind the scenes. And now we're in the, progress, uh, the process of, of bringing this to our actual calculators. But yes, you will very soon be able to, to link the actual section as well. So when you link your loads or something like that, our footing will know, hey, that's a two and a half inch uh, pipe coming in. You can, it, it'll automatically update this. So one less step, you know, for you to do. Um, we're pretty excited to have that in. And you'll see it comes in useful for other things as well, uh, which I'll get into later on. But going back to this now, we've got our two and a half by two and a half foot footing, uh, 21 inches, probably a little excessive. Maybe we can go down to uh, one foot. Uh, okay, everything is good. You know what, we'll leave it all in the green. We're happy with this. So now we've successfully linked, um, you can see our column here going to our, our footing. Um, we've successfully linked everything from our bedroom joists all the way to the ground. And we can account for every pound because as we can see, it's linked, right? So this is linked to my column, which is linked to my steel beam, which is linked to my LVL beam, which is linked to my joists in the bathroom and the bed. Every single pound is accounted for. There's no, no chance that you, know, you miss something and then that, that pound is going somewhere. Now, let's go back now to our PowerPoint. Now that we've linked all this, let's look at the next thing. So if I go here, okay, this is where it gets really interesting. We're gonna change our logos now. So actually I came back to the PowerPoint. Maybe I should just stay in clear calcs. Let's go back to clear calcs now. If I go here, I'm gonna go back to my joists in the bathroom. Let's say I've got my client here and they've just contacted me and said, you know what? We want nice slate floors in our bathroom. And they tell you this right after you've done your entire design. I'm sure that's never happened before, um, but Let's say that happened this time. So let's go here and look. Okay, I've got slate floors. A 10 PSF dead load is probably not enough. So what I can do now is I'll go to my floor load and I'm just gonna change this to 10 to 25 PSF for my dead load. And that's in my bathroom joists. And now you can see we've got the little gear icons on the left here. That's telling me it's recalculating everything behind the scenes. And you can see we've got a little progress bar going on here. Now I'm, I'm in the country right now, so my internet's a little slow, so it might take a minute or two to, to recalculate. Um, but now if I go to my member schedule, which is here, you can see everything is being recalculated as we speak. 
And so all of a sudden, I can already see, oh, my steel beam, because we remember it was at 97% earlier, is failing now. So that little extra weight from the bathroom tiles, oh, I might need a new steel beam now. So I can happily see though everything else is still passing. My micro lambs are pretty close, 100%, but they're still up to code, they're still passing, um, especially with the price of wood and the availability these days, we want to be conscious of that. So we're probably happy at staying at 100%. Um, but now I've got this one that's failing, so I got to fix that. So let's go to beam four. And this is where we're going to look at, okay, what can we do, right? So obviously we can, we can add more metal. That's the, always the solution. More metal always works. Um, one thing that we might be able to say is, Hey, maybe my, um, LVL beam, I've got a nice connector on there. It's a strong connection. I'm confident saying that it braces my uh steel beam against lateral torsional bucking so maybe i can just you use this toggle the brace at point loads i'll just switch to yes and now all of a sudden i've got you can see a brace at mid span that's preventing my, my beam from from buckling over and hey what do you see we're passing now now maybe of, of course maybe you don't feel comfortable with that or maybe the connection's not not adequate to, to actually brace the beam so maybe we don't want to do that so let's see if it no our moment is now at 105%. So we can go back here, type W8, and let's look. Uh, W8 by 21 seems to pass. Well, three pounds more per foot, that's probably okay. So there we go. Now we've passed this. And now you can see that three extra pounds per foot, you can see the little gears behind the scenes here running. I mentioned that every pound is accounted for. We've got three pounds per foot plus times 15. So an extra 45 pounds from our self weight of our beam that needs to be accounted for by our column and our footing so that's why they were um, that's why that's why you could see them recalculating so again with load linking we can make sure that every single pound is accounted for including when your client comes back and says they want to change the loads they want to put a fancy floor on or something like that um, that's where the, the, the magic of load linking really shines is everything is connected in one. Um, now, as a bit of a bonus feature here, if you're interested, I can also come here and do export to Excel. So if I do that, I'll just do export. And if I open this, you'll see now I've got my, my beams and everything. It tells me my sections, but most importantly, it gives me my reactions. So if you've got, say, uh, a builder or someone for some reason, or you like to show your reactions on your drawings, they're right here, right? So you can see your 54, 50 pounds from your W8 beam or on your LDL. Um, if you're looking for, for instance, uh, if you, you've got a contractor who wants to use a different connector, um, you can look at these to make sure that they're adequate. And it also tells you the utilization. You can swap these to percents if we want, so we can see everything. It's okay, and it also tells you, so for instance, bending moment is controlling, um, here it's the, the bearing stress, et cetera. So yeah, just a little neat feature that, that might help you out on some future projects. So with that, I'm going to go back now to um, the presentation. So let's look at some other things. Okay, so Excel export, I just went over this, right? So you can export your, your things. Um, now, one thing that I wanted to talk about is connections. So when we're talking about load paths, um, we said every pound must be accounted for and there has to be an actual continuous path all the way down to the ground. And one thing that sometimes we don't think about are connections. Um, so I, I'll give an example from a, another life where I was working and designing aluminum bridges. Um, these were truss bridges. And if you've ever designed a truss, maybe in, in school or something like that, you'll know that usually we'll, we'll treat our um, our members is all coming together in one single point, and then all the loads kind of get distributed. But if you look at the actual load path, if I've got, um, say, a load coming down this and going back up here, these little areas here between my posts or my, my members, they're basically taking all of that load. And so we've got some really high shear, some bending moments in here. Then because this is aluminum, we also have to consider ooh, the effect of welding because that weakens the, the metal. So these are all things that we have to look at. So connections become really important and it's really important that we consider, okay, every single pound is accounted for all the way, 
including through these connections. So this would be a design check that we would do when we were designing this, these bridges. Uh, now, in a more kind of maybe clear calyx context or residential context, when you've got a joist from me into a beam, you will usually specify a connector or something like that, right? Or, or maybe it'll be toe nailed or something like that. But you do need to consider, hey, do I have enough nails for my my uh, my load to go through? Or am I specking the right connector for my loads? Now, this is ta da <laughs> next feature coming to clear calyx. So um, this is something that we're probably releasing in the next week or two. Um, you will soon be able to actually connect your or link your beams to a, our database of wood connectors. Um, so you can see here, we're linking to a joist. We've got a wood beam here, two by 12, Douglas fir number one. And then it'll tell you, okay, here we're using the Simpson HUS 210 for a two by 12. And we'll check, you know, your capacities, your loads will all be linked from your um, beam calculations. And it will tell you, okay, you need that many nails. Uh, and et cetera. So we're really excited about this. I think it's, it's gonna be a really cool way to really kind of go back to this, cover the entire load path and make sure that your loads go all the way down to the ground. Um, yeah, so really exciting feature. Um, we should have that coming up really soon. Uh, but yeah, so again, it all fits into the load linking. You'll wanna be able to, to incorporate all of this. Um, so with that, I guess I'll conclude now. So the biggest thing here, load paths are the best way that we have to make sure that every single pound is accounted for that every bit of weight goes down all the way to the ground um and in simple structures obviously we can kind of do it in our head more complex structures it never hurts to make a nice drawing or or write it down and clarify okay this is how my load gets down to the ground every pound is accounted for and i'm confident that it is uh, and then we also looked at clear calcs. We can automate this whole process for you, which is sweet, especially when you've got a client who comes in at the last minute and changes the slate in their bathroom floors. Uh, that's where I think we can really shine through with our automation and save you a lot of time. So instead of redesigning everything, you clearly see instantly, okay, oh, this is passing, this isn't passing. Uh, this is something that we're pretty proud of and I, I hope that it, it saves you a lot of time. And again, I've got a little picture of the river here. Um, water flows, you know, down to the ocean, just like lows go down to the ground. Always something to, to remember when you're designing this. So with that, I'll say uh, thank you everyone for, for your time and for attending this webinar. I hope this was useful and that you learned a trick or two about clear calcs and about load paths. Um, yeah, and I guess we'll, we'll open it up for questions now. Yeah, great, great work, Laurent. The, I had a few questions come through, uh, a, a few very similar ones from uh, Dale Benjamin, I had one from Kate, and then Matthew. Um, they all had a great suggestion slash question on if there's a way when we're linking loads, uh, we're tracking that load path, um, is there a way they can know without going into the calculator um, if that's linked to something, and then also maybe a, a rudimentary diagram. I know we don't have that. That's, I think, a great suggestion, something we could work on. But what I was thinking is, Maybe you can show them, this would be like a workaround for now until we have a, a diagram, but maybe sheet groups. And if they wanted to, they could uh, kind of organize by load path there. Ah, that's a that's a great suggestion. Um, so first of all, thank you for the suggestion. It is something that we're, we're looking into, I think maybe a, a little further down the path um, to actually show you kind of a, a, a diagram, right? Where you see this is linked to this, is linked to this, and, and, and hopefully a full on diagram that shows the complexity of the load path. Um, it, it's something that we want to do. We're pretty excited about it. Um, there's a lot of things we want to do, so it, it will be coming at, at some point. But what Connor mentioned about the, the sheet groups is a great point. So if I wanted to, I could create a group here and say, let's call this one joists. And now I can move these into here. I can create a new group now, say, um, beams and I can put that here with my steel one um, now alternatively I could also create a new group and say uh, this is just call this one LVL beam linked to steel beam now you can write it whichever way you want I'm just 
Connor put me on the spot here, so I'm trying to come up with a name for it. But uh, I, I think you can you can come up with something, right? And it say steel beam holding LVL plus bathroom, and then maybe I can just have column and footings linked to above, and then I can just move these here. So the, the sheet groups do come in pretty useful, and then you can also organize obviously the order. So Maybe you know you steel beam and your VLBM beam switch, so you can drag it this way, so that you literally have you know from top down, kind of like the way that uh, the loads get carried down. And then on, obviously on the side here, you'll see it here. So my joist to here, something like that. Perfect, Laurent. Thank you. And uh, to Dale, Kate, and Matt. Those were great ideas. Uh, I know I I sent you a message, Dale, at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, our product manager, Steven, is actually working with a product designer right now, and they were tossing around that idea. We're kind of working through what a, a good version one would be to make sure it's, it's useful to you guys um, without going too in-depth and, and taking too much time so we can deploy that and make sure you guys can take advantage of it. Um, so great questions, great suggestions. Next, Laurent, I had from Daniel Kelly. Um, and if, Eva, you want to unmute Daniel, Daniel, if you have access to a mic, um, he was asking if you could go back to when you actually linked the load of a beam onto either a beam or a column, and maybe Daniel, you can expand. Um, uh, I think he wasn't entirely clear on what that process was, so I want to make sure we hammer that home since that was the, the topic here. Thank you very much. So when you add a new calculation, there was an item that you deleted prior to when you oh. uh, click the link button. And, and I'm a little unclear as to what that was. Okay, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks, Daniel, for attending, and, uh, and, and nice to hear from you. Uh, yeah, let, let's walk through it. So let's add again our steel beam and the floor girder preset here. So we'll let that load up. And so the, all our, our our calculators, we usually put default values in them, just kind of indicative of you know some typical scenarios or something like that, so that when you open it, it, it you know, solves a thing. Obviously, gotcha. um, these, these might not apply to everything. So if I scroll down to my loads, for instance, I've got, you know, a default floor load from zero to 25 foot for a 10 foot trip with, you know, 1040. Um, I mean, maybe you've got a house that, that lines up perfectly with that or something that you design it. Great. Otherwise, obviously, you'll probably want to, to change these values. Um, now, because we're linking, we probably don't want that extra 100 PLF dead load, 400 PLF live load on top of what the beams that we're linking, if we're confident that we're already accounting for every pound. Um, now, it might be that you know, you're know only linking things on one side and on the other side, you prefer to have a distributed load. So you might wanna keep this, but that in, the, in these examples, we didn't. So that's why we just deleted it. Um, same thing with the point and moment loads. Now you'll see there's the alternate uh, minimum live load. So, in some cases, I think for say industrial buildings, the code might require a you know 3,000 pound um, alternate point load uh, that you have to resist, as well as your, uh, your your distributed load. So that's what this is for. For residential, there's, there's very few situations where that's the case. So we're pretty confident in this case. Say, hey, we can just delete this, and then you know come and link to our our existing beams. I hope that answered your question, Daniel. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I didn't know that it was a default a default value that was showing up. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, that that's that's all it is there. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next, Laurent, I uh, got a question from Mohammed, um, and maybe Eva, if you can unmute Mohammed Beirouge. Uh, he had a question, just confirming through the load path. He said he assumes you can add other external loads at any points, and he just wanted to confirm that. Maybe we can unmute Mohammed if he has access to a mic, and he could expand on that if if needed. Having a bit of a hard time hearing you there, Mohammed, but I, I think I got most of your questions. So um, basically, you're saying, what if I'm linking a beam, say, to a column, and then 
on top of that beam, I've got other loads that I want to add on top of that beam. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so let's go to my column here and where we had previously linked our beam. So I'm just going to load that up. So we can see we've got our steel beam that's connected here with the eccentricity as well. So if I wanted to add, say, a 1,000 pound live load on top of it, I can create a new row. So uh, this... So if you uh, if you wanted to add on your column a lateral load, is that correct? Yes, different direction. No problem. We can also do that. So let's do a lateral load, and maybe we'll actually we'll add it at the mid span of the column. So say L over two, and in my load magnitudes, I can add say a lateral load right here. So if I want to say add a one, let's do a 500 pound lateral load. You can see here now it's going to be added here. So you can just add as many rows as you want, as many loads as you want. That's not a problem. And we'll just always be considering that. Does that answer your question, Mohamed? Exactly. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Great. Right. Great. Happy to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, good question there, Mohamed. Uh, so next, we got a, quite a bit of solid questions coming through. Um, Next, we might want to unmute Michael Roselle if we can, Eva. Um, he had a question here, Laurent. What fixicity conditions would you use to model a cantilever beam or column? And uh, Laurent might know what you're asking there, but I know personally I would need a, a bit more background on that. So if we can remute, or unmute Michael, if you can uh, expand on that. If you have access to a, a mic, mic. Oh, okay. Well, I, no worries. I can I can hop on here. Um, so, Michael, if you, if you wanted to add, model a fixed connection, and now I, I will preface this. Obviously, we, we have to be a little bit be a little bit careful about you know engineering advice, and, and every situation is different. So you'll want to make sure that that. The advice here is, is appropriate for your specific project or situation. Um, but if I wanted to say model a cantilever, let, let's have some fun here. Let's add a cantilever uh, beam that's framed in to this column. So if I go say back to my beam five, um, I've got my W12 by 40. What I will want to do, so right now you can see it's a simply supported beam, support at both ends. I'm going to want to go here and select a fixed support. So this one, and now you can see it's got the fixed support little symbol here. And I can see also as well, I've got uh, a moment at one end. And now I can delete my other support, and I've got my cantilevered beam now, right? As you can see it's got zero moment at one end, full moment at the other end. And if I look at the uh, deflection curve, let's see here. We can see it; it's uh, inclining like a, a cantilever beam. Now, this I've now got a. Uh, if I look at my reactions, I've got a thousand pound vertical and twelve thousand five hundred uh, moment at the end. So that, just like every pound has to be accounted for, every pound foot also has to be accounted for. So if I go back now to my column, this poor column is getting really overloaded, but no problem. Um, I can come in here and link that previous beam. So I'm just going to add it uh, here. Uh, it's just going to load it up. And if I go, I think it's beam five. And you can see now I've got 1,000 pound vertical reaction, 12,500 moment reaction. And let's apply it again at L over two. And now you can see I've got this beam that's linked in, 1,000 pound. Um, downwards and then 12,500 moment connection. So that's how I know every pound and every pound foot is accounted for. Now, obviously this column, you know, two and a half pipe is probably not what we want anymore, but you can see here as well, the moment is, uh, the moment distribution has changed. So I hope that answers your question, Michael. Yeah, Michael messaged me. He said he didn't have that, but he said he's all set. And then I, of course, let him know as with the rest of you guys. Any additional questions need further clarification, let me know and use that help button.
to reach Laurent, Eva, myself, and the rest of the team. Uh, got a great question from Matthew Hawkins. Um, something that, ironically, I think I was talking, I'm not sure if he's here, um, a guy named Bernie, who I was chatting with yesterday. Um, he asked, when editing the loading manually, is there a way to then select project default values? Mm. Um, say default floor load, default uh, floor live load, or whatever specific value you might have, if you're already within a calculation without creating a new one. Um, uh, one thing I'll say, and Laurent, if you have a workaround for it, it's something that our product manager and I actually were talking about last week. It's something that we'll likely have in the near future because it's a, a suggestion that's been brought up numerous times. It's a, a great idea where you can kind of just go in there, select maybe second floor living room load or, or something very specific that you use over and over. So that way you're not having to manually do it every single time. And Laurent, if you wanted to expand on that, feel free to. Yeah, that's right. So th thanks, Connor, and and thanks, Matthew, for for your great comment question here. Um, I I didn't go over the project default load specifically because we're working on, on kind of a new version. Um, but I'm I'm happy to go through it right now. So let's look at the the project defaults here. Now I'm sure some, most of you have seen this at this point. Uh, admittedly, you know, it, it looks a little scary. Uh, so this is what we're working to improve. But the interesting part here is we've got. Um, let's look at our floor loads, for instance. You can enter your default, you know, dead load, default live load, uh, default minimum live load. If so, if and then you can also select based on uh, occupation, right? So if I switch to uh, uh, school, then I've got a thousand, a hundred PS half live load and a thousand pound minimum live load. Um, let's go back to the house though. Um, I think it was this one. Uh, whoops, we've got a lot of these on here. Uh, oh, these are the addicts. My apologies. Here we go. So one and two family dwellings. So 40 PSF live below zero. Um, so I can change these on here, and you'll see, for instance, if I go now to my bedroom joists. Um, let me just open this up. Now it's saying 163% because it was looking at the 100 PSF. Uh, there we go, so 76%. So if I go to my loads, and now if I, it's so 1040, if I select it, you can see there's this little formula, right? So project default, WDF, and then comma 10. So the first thing I'll say, you can just ignore the last part. If I remove it, um, it doesn't it doesn't change anything. Um, this project default formula, or function, or whatever you want to call it, basically goes and picks up values from the project default. So if I wanted to say instead use um, my roof live load, I could just change this to W, so dead floor. If I change it to R, now I've got my 15 PSF roof load. Um, right now, I think it's F, right? So 10. And now I can do the same thing, you know, W live. Now, the one thing I will say, um, this is where we want to improve. Um, we don't necessarily have an easy way to get these codes, call them, right now. Uh, so that said, instead of, say, creating a new template and redoing all your work, what I would recommend is you can copy-paste these formulas and put them into whichever template you want. So if I yeah. you know, copy this and, and post it here, um, or if I want, say, my, my roof live load, um, that, that works too, right? WLR. So that, that's why I would recommend to do it for now. Um, I'm gonna add this to our to-do list though, to just maybe make a, a list of these these functions that you can use. So make your life a little easier. So currently what I've been doing is I have a Word document or a notepad document that I've copied those into, and then I just have them oh. sitting open next to it and copy and paste them back and forth. So. <laughs> well, sounds like you're doing what I was just saying we'd like to do, so <laughs> nice. <laughs> it, it would be nice to have a full list of them so I knew what they all yeah. were. Absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, yes, we will uh, create a, a very similar document to what you already have, I imagine. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I'm headed to Toronto next week with to, with uh, if you guys have met Chris, yo, virtually. So that sounds like a fun late night uh, activity where we just create this list one by one. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, so next, Dale sent through a couple great questions, two of them related and one of them not necessary, necessarily related to the first few. But he was saying, Laurent, that he noticed this week that the eccentricity on the steel uh, columns already has an eccentricity, a default in there, or some columns have a default eccentricity and some just default to zero. Um, so he was just curious, you know, if there was any reasoning behind that. And then maybe after we touch on that, uh, we can go to his next question. And then Eva, if you want to unmute Dale, if you wanted to expand on that question. Yeah, that's right. I, I did wood columns this week and saw that they had that eccentricity and without really understanding what it was. Uh, yeah. Anyways, and then today I see that the steel one did not have a default. That's that's all I was commenting on how, you know, when to use it, when not to, whatever. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and again, I, I'll, I'll sound like a broken record, but we have to be careful, right? Uh, uh, every situation is different. So so you got to, uh, you know, use your judgment uh, to some extent. Um, the reason that we've got eccentricity on, on wood columns by default and not on steel is is basically just from talking to, to, to our users, to, to people, engineers in the industry. Um, what we found is that the typical practice has generally been not to have eccentricity on steel columns versus wood columns where you would have one sixth of the, the section dimensions as eccentricity. Uh, some of it, uh, the, the wood standard, for instance, when you, especially when you're dealing with, say, LVL or PSL or something like that, the, the composite products, some of them will require you to have an eccentricity. Um, so they will specifically say in the, 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 the manufacturer data, you need eccentricity of you know, D over six or B over six or something like that. And it, we, we have found that it's a pretty common practice in wood design, less so in steel design. However, obviously, um, again, steel, a lot of it, a lot more of it depends on the connections, right? So if you've got a, a plate that's sticking out for your beam to come on, then that's probably going to add some eccentricity that you want to consider. Uh, but, but that's really kind of up to, to you and to the specific conditions that you're dealing with. Good, thank you. All right, great, uh, great response there, Laurent. Hopefully that helps Dale. And then Eva, we could just leave Dale unmuted if if he wants. Uh, I don't know if he he really needs to expand on this because uh, it was a well worded question. But basically, Laurent, how would Dale or anybody add uh, the random point load when designing a deck, for example, where the code requires that you have that? Uh, I believe it's called you know better than me the alternative minimum live load. Or the deck live load, that point load that they need to account for. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know what? I'll do it with the, this Joyce template since I've got it here already. Um, basically, the way you'll want to do it is as a point load, right? So if you say have an alternate minimum live load, I'm going to guess it's probably two or three hundred pounds. I, I, I forget, but let's let's call it three hundred for this. Um, I can add the three hundred, and you can see here actually, you can see the L2 here. So alternate live load. What this is doing is it'll actually, it won't apply this load at the same time as your main load, right? Because if I remember correctly, most of the time when you've got the alternate minimum live load, it's either your, your load in PSF or your load in pounds. So when you add it as L2, it's it's going to treat the, both of them separately. So that, that's a good thing to know. So thanks for bringing that up, actually. That, that We don't talk about that enough. Um, and it doesn't, does it distribute it, though, uh, you know, when we're on a line load on the beam? Um, that I guess that's kind of the question. Is it on every 16 inch one or is it, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a great question as well. So this is actually a setting that we have in our project. So you're thinking, right, if this is um, linked to a bunch of beams below, is every single choice going to have a 300 pound load on it? Right, right? exactly, yeah. exactly. So this is actually an option that we have. So if you go to your project defaults, um, This is it, it's a it's a little hidden, admittedly. But if you look here, you'll see exclude L2 from load linking. So by default, it's set to yes. So your 300 pound won't propagate down. Um, if you did want it to, though, you could obviously switch this to no. And in that case, basically every joist would have the 300 pound on it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Yeah. Thanks for the questions, Dale. Uh, Lastly, and then I'm responding, uh, Matthew, I'm responding to your question here via chat. 
Uh, but the last question we have as of now, of course, we got uh, about five more minutes. Laurent is from Jay. Uh, he's asked, uh, he knows we can link, say, a joist onto a girder or a, another beam um, at, say, 16 inches or something. Uh, but he's curious if there's a way to apply the same point load, say, four feet on center across a beam without having to link. So thinking maybe uh, you might have a better uh, answer here, but maybe we can show him how to just modify that tributary width or on center spacing. And then I'd be also very interested to hear Jay's thoughts on how useful he think a copy load function would be. That's something we don't have, but I think it's a great idea. So Eva, if we're able to unmute Jay. Yeah, I think a copy load function would be useful. I guess I was just mostly curious, um, yeah, if there's a way to do a repetitive point load, um, especially for like multi-span beams where you can't necessarily just distribute it out and you know where it might control on one of the spans or something like that. But yeah, thanks, Jay. That that's a really good question. Uh, as of yet, to be honest, we we don't have a nice way to do that. To be to be completely honest, um, the the best way is is probably with the line loads. Um, now you're st you're talking about the continuous beam, so I I can yeah. You know, let's make this into a continuous beam. Let's add a support at 15 feet here. So I've got now. Yeah, and I guess just also to clarify, uh, in the situation where applying it as a line load you know, wouldn't necessarily be conservative or wouldn't necessarily be equivalent for one of those spans. Uh, right. So, or, you know, say you only have two point loads on one of the span or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So so that's a good point, right? So the first thing I'll say, if you wanted to say apply the line load to only one span in this case, you could say link, let's do our, our joist here, um, from zero to 15, right? And then you would only get the joist on the one span. Uh, now. For the other side here, say you only had two joists that landed on here and you do want to model them separately, you could link them as, as point loads. So if I say wanted to link, I could just also add, say the, the bathroom joist. Now, if I link this as an individual joist, it will be the reaction from a single joist only. So if I added, say at 20 feet, it'll show up right um, here. Now, if you've got a lot of these, completely agree with you, Jay. Um, right now, it, it's a bit troublesome, right? So you'd have to add one, basically one row for every uh, location. That's something that I think uh, we're going to implement better. Now, one thing that you could try, if you do want to kind of make this easier on yourself, um, I'm going to try this as, as we go, so no promises. But if you did say, um, say you've got a five foot spacing, you could type five foot times row index like this. And let's see what that does. So now if I type it, I can copy and paste this and I've got a regular spacing, right? And now I can just come in and say link my, uh, my joist every time. So this is another thing that we'll probably want to put on our little formula sheet, but this row index thing, you can use it and it'll just say, so it starts at zero, one, two, three, four, and then you would be able to kind of add a regular spacing. So I hope this little trick helps you, Jay, there. Um, I, I wish there was a kind of a, a neater solution here, uh, but yeah, hopefully that, that helps a bit. Yeah, that's definitely uh, doing the row spacing. That, uh, that seems like it does what I was looking for. Thanks. Great. Yeah, that was a great question, Jay. And Laurent, I'm, maybe I'm seeing either help videos or uh, maybe a future webinar just purely dedicated to these little tricks, the time-saving tools for our uh, the power users who want to get into stuff like that. Yeah, they're, they're, there's definitely something we can do here. Yes. And actually, uh, I I believe... about, you found some stuff um, that that like this, you know, little tips and tricks that you want to share. Uh, go ahead and post them in the chat. I'm sure everybody will be happy to to hear about them. Yes, that's a great call, Laurent. Something that eventually we'd love to do here at Clear Calcs have like a, a Calcs community where you guys can kind of give suggestions to each other, workarounds, uh, efficiency tools. Um, and then Michael just sent through a question that I think is is a great one to end on and something that'll apply to everybody. He just asked.
you find this webinar's recording, which is a great question. Michael and everybody else, uh, we will send out a follow-up email to everybody that registered, uh, especially you guys today that have attended, and you guys will be able to access, rewatch the webinar, um, send it along to your friends and peers and colleagues. What we're gonna do as we continue to have these, um, these monthly learn hours, monthly webinars, is we'll just have a page on our website that's gonna just house all the different recordings so that way you can watch back if desired. All right. All right, well, well hey, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for your time. Yes, thank you everybody for attending. Very excited, as I've mentioned before, to start doing these more frequently. And moving forward, hopefully you guys all have my email, my number. Uh, use that blue help button in the bottom right corner of your screen that is sending questions to Laurent, to me, to Eva, to the rest of our, our team. So make sure to use that help and ask. Um, but yeah, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, getting back to engineering and designing. And that's what Laurent and I will do. Cheers, everyone. Take care.